Hello and welcome to the Figgy Art Museum's Virtual Thursdays at the Figgy program series. My name is Melissa Moore and I'm Director of Education at the Figgy and we are very happy you could join us tonight for this exciting program. For the, for the immediate future, we're hosting these Virtual Thursday programs most weeks, so please check the Figgy's website for up-to-date program information and for registration options. Next week, we will hear from artist Wendy Redstar, whose work is featured in the exhibition Magnetic West, The Enduring Allure of the American West. The program will be a little different than most weeks because rather than having it on our regular Thursday evening, we'll be featuring Wendy Red Star on Tuesday, September 15th at 6.30 p.m. And I will go ahead and put that in the chat when, I'm, when I turn things over for the evening, just so you have that reminder. It's a little different, but we're still very excited to be hosting Wendy. Just like this week, after you register online for that program, you'll receive a link to join the program on the day it's scheduled. And we're able to offer these Thursday programs at no cost to you, thanks to the generous sponsorship provided by Chris and Mary Rayburn. Chris and Mary, for all that you do, thank you. So three quick figgy updates before we get going. We are still recommending the visitors to the museum check out our timed visitor sessions online and reserve a spot. This will ensure that you have as much time as possible to enjoy the galleries since the sessions are limited and we clean the museum in between each one. Second, our cafe has reopened, very exciting, and will be providing service from 11 to 2 every Tuesday through Saturday. For those of you who have been with us for a while in what we're calling the before times, you'll notice that we're actually open an extra day. In the past, we were open from Tuesday through Friday. Now it's Tuesday through Saturday, again, 11 to 2, and we look forward to seeing you there. Number three, just in case you haven't visited the museum in recent days, I wanted to let you know that our beautiful elevator is undergoing repairs and it's going to be out of service for most of the month. But if there's one thing we have plenty of at the museum besides art, it's stairs. So if you are able, please feel free to visit anyway. You can use the stairs until the elevator is running once again. And then two quick program notes. Since this program is hosted in webinar format, you can type any questions you have for the presenter into the Q&A box or the chat box, and we will address them during the Q&A portion of tonight's program. If you'd prefer to ask your question directly, please use the raise your hand function, which is in the participant list. And when we can, we'll be able to give you the option to unmute your microphone and you can ask your question or make a comment directly. Okay, the other reminder about the program tonight is that um, we are recording the session for archival purposes, just so you're aware. At this time, it is my great pleasure to turn things over to Andrew Wallace, the Figgy's Director of Collections and Exhibitions and the Curator of Magnetic West, who will be introducing the program this evening. Andrew, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Melissa. It's wonderful to be here, but it's most uh, wonderful for us to host Caro Romero. We've had up to now three wonderful programs by three very different photographers. Well, one from Los Angeles, Kara, of course, being from Southern California and uh, Santa Fe, um, and John Sanderson from New York City of all places, all of whom who have distinguished careers in producing wonderful work, uh, largely about what interests them most, what they're passionate about, and life uh, to a large degree in the West. One of the things that is um, so sort of very interesting to me is the emergence of a whole school, I should say, of uh, photographers in particular who are coming out of the indigenous communities uh, who are showing the rest of the country uh, a different way of looking at the world and, um, and the ways in which uh, indigenous uh, people take command and give agency to their own voice and represent themselves in the ways that they feel is most important. Um, both for themselves and for the rest of us. In a, um, a, a review of David Truer's book, uh, The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, uh, Ned Blackhawk uh, wrote about, um, and this was for the New York Times, wrote about this emergence of, of wonderful um, politicians and artists and writers um, since essentially since the 1960s, since the civil rights movement and the rise of the American Indian movement. And it was a wonderful sort of encapsulation of all that is going on. And uh, it was very important to us to uh, try to include as many of those voices as we could in this exhibition. And to the degree that we could, we, we've done so. And, and I'm very grateful that we have Carol Romero and um, Zig Jackson and Will Wilson and 
uh, Ray Young Bear, and I'm forgetting somebody. Oh, uh, Wendy Redstar, of course, uh, in the exhibition. And for those of you who you've probably heard this before, but this exhibition has been in the works for probably five years. And over the course of those five years, we've been sort of discovering new people. And I owe great debt to Wendy Redstar uh, for it was uh, Wendy who introduced us to Will Wilson and Zig Jackson. And it was through Mark Del Vecchio at Peter's Projects that I was introduced to the work of Cara Romero. So, and then through Cara Romero, we were introduced to the work of uh, Star Montana, who, uh, who's a South, um, an Angelino uh, photographer, a young Angelino photographer. Uh, so it's a, it's a funny way that we, we organize these exhibitions, um, but what it does allow us to do is discover things we wouldn't have seen uh, otherwise and to meet people we wouldn't meet otherwise. So with that, I would like to introduce Kara. Um, she is uh, an amazing photographer, as you will see in her presentation of slides. It's quite a robust career. Um, her work is very dynamic, and there are so many elements in uh, each of her images that it's very hard for, for somebody to sort of encapsulate all that and you know, maybe in a single sentence. Uh, so with that, um, here's Kara Romero. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Melissa and Andrew, for um, first of all, inviting me to um, this virtual platform and for everybody that's in the audience. I can't see you, but thank you so much for tuning in and um, connecting with us uh, um, through the computer. And I hope to give you a, a nice presentation on um, just some autobiography of self and identity and how that informs my work. I'm a contemporary fine art photographer. Um, I also uh, make use and incorporate the use of photo illustration in my work and I'll go through um, some of that and the process and uh, the reasoning um, behind um, the pieces that I make which are often described as staged and theatrical. Um, a little bit about myself. I was born um, in the Los Angeles area. I was born in Inglewood um, and my family grew up in the Hawthorne and Redondo area. Um, I'm from a biracial family. My father is Native American um, from the Chimwevi Indian tribe and my family relocated in 1979 from the Los Angeles area to the Chimwevi Valley Indian Reservation, which is in the heart of the Mojave Desert. Um, so part of that majestic west, um, the land of the Joshua trees, um, and I'll show a little bit of that landscape that I'm from. Um, uh, fast forward to another port, part of my life where I had an urban upbringing. Uh, my parents split and I ended up in Houston, Texas um, with a non-native um, culture shock uh, and then moved to Santa Fe um, in college. And I started out as a cultural anthropology major um, at the University of Houston, um, which led me to um, a black and white film class um, where I very quickly fell in love with the medium and understood that uh, I could tell a modern story of Native Americans um, in a way that words um, couldn't. And uh, so I ran off to Santa Fe to come to the Institute of American Indian Arts here in Santa Fe, um, which was an incredible experience for a young person in 1999. Um, and at that time, everything was switching over to uh, from film to digital. So I continued on and got another degree in uh, essentially commercial photography. It was an applied science degree in photography technology. Um, where by then I had a, a formal film training under my belt, um, as well as lots of commercial um, lighting, editorial, um, product, advertisement. And you see now kind of that long, strange journey has led me back um, to kind of fusing all of those styles together into a really contemporary um, autobi autobiographical voice. Um, without further ado, um, this is uh, the long lineage of women um, from Chimwevi, um, again, from the heart of the Mojave Desert. My family is uh, truly from the Las Vegas uh, and larger Las Vegas, Nevada and surrounding areas, um, which were right from that tri-state area of, 
uh, Nevada, California, and Arizona, with our reservation being within um, the California border. This is my great grandmother and my grandmother and myself all in that great Mojave Desert landscape. The Chimwevi Valley Indians are known um, as basket weavers and most museum collections that you visit uh, were some of the finest basket weavers from the Great Basin area. It is um, the Great Basin, so the hottest place in the United States. Um, the Mojave Desert uh, goes from the San Bernardino Mountains outside of Los Angeles um, up through Nevada and all the way down south to um, Yuma, uh, Arizona. We have a very different landscape from anywhere else in the United States, which, which I'm just incredibly in love with. This is actually um, a view from the reservation. Uh, it's the California side of the Colorado River. Um, so while we are from the hottest place in the United States, about 125, maybe 150 miles outside of Death Valley, um, it is a cradle of life there in the Mojave Desert. Um, this is now uh, known as Lake Havasu. So our traditional valley was flooded um, by uh, the, the making of the Parker Dam um, through the Reformation Act um, and the emphasis on hydroelectric energy. So a lot of Native Americans were flooded out of their traditional valleys um, by the um, construction of dams in the 30s and 40s, which brought the United States out of the Great Depression, um, but uh, had a different effect for indigenous peoples, which is an ongoing theme in my work as it pertains to um, how indigenous peoples and people of color are affected um, by the development of big energy in our backyards. So I wanted to start off um, with that theme of the West um, with a series that uh, I completed in 2019. So just a year ago, um, these billboards uh, went up as part of the Desert X Biennial. Um, it was my first public art installation. So outside of a museum and outside of a gallery, um, we uh, installed five billboards on the Gene Autry Trail, which is a major thoroughfare from Palm Springs to Los Angeles. Um, I think I can play this so you can get a little bit of an idea of um, what that looked like in real time. And the Desert X Biennial um, is 25 international artists that were invited to create land-based art installations in Coachella Valley, which is within the Mojave Desert, um, in response to the landscape. And I was the only indigenous person that had ever um, been invited to participate in the Desert X Biennial. And I really wanted to concentrate on a response to the landscape um, politically, culturally, um, and from a native perspective um, to really ground people in Southern California um, that they are truly on uh, Indian land. Uh, we suffer a great amount of erasure uh, in history um, and education in uh, the greater Los Angeles and all of California really. Um, California has one of the most brutal history, California, I'm sorry, California has one of the most brutal colonial histories in the United States um, that is untaught in the education systems. Um, so this for me was an incredible honor and opportunity to bring visibility um, to the indigenous communities of the Mojave Desert um, for, uh, for not only ourselves, but also for the outside um, groups that don't know the rich history of indigenous peoples in Coachella Valley. So um, I really wanted to incorporate um, four young boys from our reservation. And I thought it would be really good to help tie people to this idea of um, indigenous worldview that um, our spirits and our ancestors um, are here and around in the landscape experiencing um, all of the development uh, of everything that we do in the landscape, this ontological tie to the landscape, this idea that um, 
um, that there is no linear time, but that instead all of our spirit beings and everybody exist all together. So in order to do that, um, I used four modern boys from our reservation that represented time travelers. Um, so they're dressed pre-colonial. You'll also see that they're um, kind of show up a little bit futuristic in this idea um, that time doesn't exist and that we're uh, every bit as indigenous as we ever were, and that these things are in our environment existing all at the same time. This was taken uh, on our reservation. Um, it's a truck that sits across from my house on the reservation that sat there for probably 15 to 20 years. Um, and it's just uh, such a sweet photograph that really illustrates how um, our humanity is universal. Um, and to give that humanness to um, our indigenous youth and to the outside world of how little boys play everywhere. Um, really grounding folks, um, again, here in this idea that Southern California is indigenous land and that we are ever present within the landscapes and really tying people to um, not only this quintessential Los Angeles, um, greater Southern California landscape, but um, grounding people in um, the sense that uh, indigenous communities are thriving. This piece is called Indian Canyon um, and this is a reminder um, that uh, our spirit beings are there in the landscape protecting our sacred sites. Um, so this is a kind of a ghostly haunting image. It was taken um, before the sun rose. So um, prior to sunrise gives it that really um, soft ethereal lighting. Um, uh, at the mouth of what's called Indian Canyon. So a very sacred site specifically to the Agua Caliente band of Cahuilla Indians. And then of course, to all of the sister tribes um, surrounding our brothers and sisters at Cahuilla. So again, this reminder um, of our worldview that uh, our ancestors and our spirits are within the landscape experiencing everything and continuing to protect sacred sites. This piece is called Evolvers. Um, it's my personal favorite of the series. And this is a response uh, again to that recurring theme that shows up in my work um, about uh, what we call eco-apartheid or sometimes people call it environmental racism, um, but it's a both and. So it's called Evolvers and shows um, kind of like this fun um, embrace of uh, renewables and wind energy. Wind energy. Um, and simultaneously, it kind of looks like um, this sci-fi poster. And I had this idea that um, what if our ancestors came back um, and popped up and experienced uh, this um, development of these gigantic turbines? Um, I think the outside um, communities and culture view these um, large swaths of seemingly empty land as just that, as empty. But this reminder that um, all of these areas, these washes are the tide pools of the Mojave Desert, and they actually contain this rich, rich history of indigenous peoples, of flora, of fauna, of biodiversity. Um, and here we just have this collision of paradigms. Um, we're evolving. Um, we're embracing renewable and wind energy in the Mojave Desert. Um, this is kind of an iconic landscape of Southern California. And so the four boys um, are caught candidly running through the wash. Uh, just as an aside, the four boys are two sets of brothers um, from the Chimwebe Valley Indian Reservation. Um, so the the sincere fun that they're having in racing through this wash is just that. Um, it's very sincere. Um, uh, this was taken with a strobe light um, off camera. Uh, so a lot of people ask about my use of Photoshop. Um, this is um, taken with the sunlight uh, coming in from the left and from the right. Um, there's a person standing off camera here. Uh, with a strobe light so that the young boys are caught in midair. So they are not photoshopped in midair, they're actually caught in motion in midair. And then three photos are stitched together to get that long panoramic. Um, it's an interesting perspective that's required for the billboards and that's how I shot all of the long billboards was in three um, different images and then stitched them together. Responding to the political landscape of Southern California, 
Um, we have a lot of indigenous ancestry that transcends the um, colonial border. Um, and if you have an opportunity to um, have your art and advertisement placed on a billboard, I thought it would be very important to um, advertise love for uh, our migrant workers and the, um, um, the violence of the proposed wall to our southern border um, that disrupts um, traditional migration of not only animals, but also people. Um, all four of these boys hold ancestry that predates a colonial border. Um, they are both um, indigenous from the north of the U.S.-Mexican border, as well as hold indigenous ancestry from um, Opata to the south. Um, as well as Chimuevi uh, and Mojave are known to, were known to traverse the border um, for thousands of years. This is a piece um, that um, is placed and does belong um, in the Figgy Museum as part of the Magnetic West show. Um, this piece was also featured on PBS Craft in America. Um, they came to my reservation to film a, a partial documentary, not only on identity, but on process of creating. Um, so I had had this idea um, to kind of blend uh, this idea of um, pop culture um, so 21st century icon, um, iconography with um, indigenous traditional. Um, and to me, this idea, this fusion of the two kind of reinforces this idea um, that we're ever evolving and also ever permanent. Um, so this is a fun play on, of course, the very famous um, Abbey Road. This one is called the 17 Mile Road. This is uh, the ro long road into our very rural reservation in the Mojave Desert. So just um, fun. Again, the same uh, two sets of brothers, four cousins. Um, I've had so much fun working with these young boys in the landscape um, and also just kind of developing uh, um, their professional careers as um, subjects I go back home about four or five times a year. And um, lately I've been photographing them each and every time I go home uh, with this being the most recent. Um, all of Southern California is tied together through um, what is known as bird singing and dancing. Um, Chimwebees are known specifically for uh, the salt songs, which um, are uh, part of not only our culture, but the greater um, Southern Paiute Nation, of which we're the southernmost band of um, the 17 Southern Paiute Nations. Um, this one is called The Path, uh, and it was taken on a hilltop um, at sunset uh, on the Chimwevi Valley Indian Reservation, and it shows the four boys um, on the path to becoming our future uh, culture bearers and singers. Um, this was um, my most recent and favorite piece that uh, I created. To indigenous peoples, um, our cultural landscape is how I like to refer to what most people just talk about as landscape. Um, to me, that encompasses um, so much more than just um, landmarks within the environment, um, but also um, relationship um, as far as like migration paths and um, the medicine and the flora and fauna and the way those things um, all work together uh, with also our ceremony. This one is called For the Kawea Boys. Um, they were dear friends um, to myself and to our tribe um, that came and imparted their knowledge of bird songs to a group of young folks on my reservation. Um, this particular photograph is taken exactly um, where my family is from, which is near Searchlight, Nevada, in a place called Nipton, right on the California-Nevada border, um, full of Joshua Tree Forest. Um, and our ceremony and bird songs um, begin at dusk. Um, so this one is uh, a nod to our singers and dancers back home that when the sun goes down and the stars start to twinkle, um, we all think of each other. This is um, taken from the same uh, uh, photo shoot 
Um, and this is again, it's called Nipton Highway. These are my two sons. So those are brothers. Um, Santiago and Paris is now seven years old, but he was a baby in this one and um, taken on the exact, uh, in, in the exact area where I'm from. And back to the subject of cultural landscape, um, most of the time um, you'll see in my photographs um, humans in connection to the landscape, always reinforcing this um, indigenous worldview that we are inseparable from the landscape, that indigenous peoples experience um, the changes in the landscape, development of the landscape, um, and are also the stewards of 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity. Um, so I like to kind of hit that one home when I talk about cultural landscape. This is a series from uh, 2015. Um, these were taken underwater. Um, a lot of people ask me if those were Photoshop. No, we were actually um, with scuba gear underwater um, here at a local pool in Santa Fe. Um, this idea um, came to me from um, my larger indigenous community um, experiencing uh, the effects of climate change and um, the new flooding um, that was happening in areas around the tar sands to the north. Their ice bridges um, are melting and they're not able to get off the reservation. Um, we're seeing sea levels rising. We're seeing fires um, cause erosion and new flooding in areas. And so I had this um, idea in my mind's eye that uh, I would um, photograph um, the great flood. And as I started kind of um, working with this concept, um, I remembered uh, that I'm from a landscape that had also been flooded um, at Lake Havasu and what it feels like to enter those waters back home and remember um, the suffering of the generations before the great sadness of the flood that came and realized that, um, of course, we were not the only tribe um, that experienced flooding, but that there were many, um, which come up later in the series. Uh, and you'll also notice that um, these images also kind of come back full circle in the sense that they're um, very peaceful and um, very haunting and uh, in kind of a free fall and as if they've given in. And this kind of loops back to this indigenous worldview of our acceptance of the power of mother nature, um, the acceptance of um, the power of water. And again, our, um, our, our synergy um, with the element of water and with the natural environment and order of life. I chose tribes um, that had all been either presently um, or historically affected by flooding. Um, this one, for exa example, is um, of Chinupa Hanska Luger, um, who is an amazing contemporary artist um, who is from um, both the uh, Fort Berthold Reservation, um, which is Mandan Hadatsa Arikara, that were flooded um, out of their ancestral territory by Lake Sacagawea and placed up on a big chunk of clay where they discovered oil. Um, Chinupa is also uh, from the Standing Rock Reservation. This image was taken prior to um, the Standing Rock uh, protest um, that all of the world um, watched uh, several years ago, I think about four years ago now. And um, this was the idea that not only were we affected by flooding, um, but we are affected by um, oil extraction on our reservations. So one of the other themes um, that for me is really important um, is uh, to always um, kind of reference the, the modernity of indigenous peoples and remind people um, that uh, while there was this incredible body of work by Edward Curtis that captured the world's imagination, um, that we were in fact not a vanishing race and that we continue um, to thrive and survive and have these beautiful and um, resilient lives. Uh, and so this I kind of describe, this one is called TV Indians. Um, it also belongs to um, the Figgy Museum. 
uh, as part of this show. And um, this is a postmodern Curtis, is if I had to sum it up in one sentence. Um, the idea behind um, this piece, I think it really comes from a dreamscape and really from a surreal place is where the concept started. Um, I really wanted to talk about environmental degradation and consumerism with all of these old box TVs. So we went down um, and we found all of these TVs at the recycling center in Albuquerque. And we did take a generator out there and we plugged them in. Um, and these are my family members. Um, this is my daughter on the left, um, Ka Falwell, who you'll see um, show up in my photographs quite a bit. I typically use um, friends and family, um, which helps me uh, stay true to story. Um, and also, um, um, I think, uh, counter the exploitive nature of photography. Um, so we decide together um, the stories that we feel are important and or appropriate to tell. Um, and I can do that. I feel better with friends and family. This is my son, Santiago Romero, and my dear friend, um, Dina DeVore and her baby. Um, on the TVs, um, you'll see that some of them are actually turned on. And then um, on the other TVs, um, we chose, uh, my husband and I had great fun choosing um, ways that Native Americans are portrayed in the media. And so we picked um, very nuanced images that um, while they may um, be stereotypical, they're also somewhat beloved within our communities. And I think that that's because that's the only depictions that we had um, growing up. So this is um, just quickly uh, Billy Jack from the 70s. Um, there's Iron Eyes Cody. Um, he wasn't even Indian. He was Italian. Um, there's Thunderheart, Dances with Wolves, um, the great uh, movie Smoke Signals by Chris Eyre. There's Tonto and the Lone Ranger, um, The Raising of the Flag at Iwo Jima, uh, Little Big Man, The Detonation of the Atomic Bomb here in New Mexico, and a reference to Alcatraz over here. Um, I think that this piece is so interesting, um, and sometimes I refer to uh, my grandmother um, growing up describing how um, Native Americans back then um, really didn't know that there was a Great Depression. And I've thought about that so much um, throughout my life in kind of uh, this reminder that on reservations and this um, great amount of cultural privacy that we have is actually a form of passive resistance. Um, that because we lived in persecution um, for, for so long um, during um, colonial times and through ongoing genocide that we really had to kind of go underground to keep our cultures intact. Um, and we were often um, living below socioeconomic or median income. Um, so we had different ways of surviving um, for the last many, many hundreds of years. And so this photograph kind of shows this parallel universe. So on the TV is kind of how the outside world um, portrays us in this really kind of crazy way um, compared to the natives that are here and are actually completely culturally intact. There's this great juxtaposition about what's going on in the foreground and what's going on in the TVs. This one, um, also part of the Figgy Art Museum, is called Coyote Tales Number no. One. Um, this one was a, a really fun, really playful piece. Um, I had the opportunity to photograph. Um, it really started from this opportunity to photograph this low rider um, from the Española area. And I began to um, kind of pull apart and examine um, ways uh, that we as Native Americans also exist within these subcultures. So it's kind of like an unexamined way um, that we don't show up a lot in media representation, but in real life, um, we do have affinity for a lot of these subcultures. So this series is to be continued. Um, the use of Coyote in this image uh, was, he's 
our fabled character in California and many other Native American cultures throughout the United States. And when I say fabled character, I mean that coyote usually shows up when bad decisions are about to be made. Um, so uh, here we have them in front of um, this really iconic sign here in New Mexico um, that allows um, people to really question um, who are the saints and who are the sinners and um, kind of this idea of, you know, who am I to judge as um, the Pope recently said. Um, and Coyote being there really uh, just reminds um, people that uh, while there's um, questionable decisions being made, um, he also represents humanity and um, that we love him anyways. And so this is just like a really fun um, point in a narrative, um, a kind of celebration of youth and these times when we have a lot of hard lessons to learn, um, but we're busy painting the town red. How's that? Um, this series was from um, a series where uh, we, um, I worked with Marcus Ammerman, who is an incredible artist, um, multimedia artist and performance artist and a local celebrity that dresses up as Buffalo Man as part of his performance art. And we collaborated on a series of incorporating Buffalo Man into iconic images. This one is called Last in the Market. And I just really love this piece because it encompasses um, so many types of photography. Um, we have uh, this idea of photo illustration, um, this commercial lighting techniques, um, and then also this editorial um, flavor to it, and really um, also this documentary piece to it. Um, these are 13 uh, contemporary artists um, living and working in Santa Fe at the time. Um, the only image that I know of uh, that has um, 13 uh, contemporary Native artists all in one place. Um, so I love it for that reason. Um, I also love this piece because for me it was uh, it was kind of um, pivotal in my career. Um, it had a lot of humor and it was really well received within my community um, for its sense of humor. And I think um, instead of uh, the traditional um, way in which outside culture wants to see inside um, native culture, it kind of um, flips the narrative in this way of like, you know, reminding people that we're um, completely um, literate in pop culture, um, that we're thriving and existing within these modern contexts and that we understand non-native culture too. Um, so just really um, uh, a really poignant piece in our sense of humor as well. I feel like I might be missing a slide um, here uh, and I'm gonna just look for it further back, um, but I think it's just missing. Um, this was another piece from the same series. The next group of images, um, I'm really also known for uh, my use of women um, taking a strong center stage. Uh, and I really um, love to be a native woman um, behind the camera. I feel like it's a really subtle but really powerful shift. And I'm from a tribe um, that has not only a female creator, but great um, gender equity. So a lot of female leadership um, within our tribe. Um, and uh, so I think that that really comes through in my artwork um, where I really aim to uplift um, the, and empower um, Native women and um, talk about things through visual imagery like our um, belief in the supernatural in everyday life. Um, I'm really inspired by the writings of the supernatural women of Louise Erdrich. Um, if you're familiar with her, um, she's got this incredible use of what we call in uh, literature magical realism. And I really love, um, she was a huge influence on me as a young woman. Um, and so also uh, later, as I found my voice as an artist, she became very influential to me um, in this idea of magical realism and how to uh, visualize um, the innate strength we have as Native women 
as well as these incredible stories um, that are carried down and gifted to us through thousands of years. Um, this image is of Ka Falwell. She is a clay artist um, here um, from Santa Clara. We painted her in clay and a second photograph of a Mesa Verde vessel is laid over her skin. Um, her hair is caught in motion at one eight thousandth of a second um, to capture that temperamental um, moment um, of when you fire the clay and all of the beautiful um, stories that come along with Clay Woman. This one is called Nikki. Um, and all of my um, images of Native American women are named uh, for the woman that they are. Again, this one is called Ka. Uh, this one is called Nikki, giving agency um, to the woman. And each of these pieces uh, are made in collaboration with the models to tell um, so much about what's important to them, um, to talk about their own identity, um, their relationship to their bodies, um, their relationships to these ideas of life giving, um, of Mother Earth, of um, Earth Goddess, all of these ideas kind of wrapped into these visual, visual depictions of the women themselves. Again, um, these connections to the landscape. This is Veda. Uh, and this is uh, the Colorado River, um, Lake Havasu. So this is um, literally our backyard and really is just this um, very calm, tranquil moment, again, taken before sunrise out in the river that we all grew up on. This one is Sheridan taken in the wash. This one is called Niktlan Siwadl. Um, it is of two Azteca sisters um, that live in Albuquerque and travel back and forth and are very proud of their Aztec ancestry. Um, this one was done uh, in collaboration with the two sisters in celebration of Dia de los Muertos, which is a tradition that goes back um, 3000 years here in um, the greater New Mexico area. This one is Thai. This one is Jenna. This one is my daughter, Cricket. This one is Abigail. The next series of photographs um, are still um, where women take a strong center stage. And uh, this is from a series called First American Girls. And just for a time check, just so everybody knows, I have about um, seven more slides and um, we'll be at the conclusion and people will have a chance to ask questions. Um, First American Girls, um, it really comes back to this idea of representation um, in modern and dominant culture and how um, often when we are represented um, or depicted by um, people other than ourselves, how those depictions don't come out quite right. And my husband comes from a long line of doll collectors and um, his mother uh, was non-native. She collected dolls um, and my husband collects, they call them action figures, I call them dolls. <laughs> and um, we ha had a daughter of our own um, that we wanted to um, find dolls for that were um, appropriate and that could speak to her identity, um, for which we realized after years of searching, there was um, quite the paucity of uh, Native American dolls. Um, and so uh, I had this idea that I would begin to create this series uh, first American girls um, and place, um, create these doll boxes um, and these dolls uh, that I knew existed in real life um, and gave uh, great love and attention to detail um, of each of the women that arrive in this series. Um, this one is Naomi. Her mother is Liamata Frawa. She is a celebrated regalia maker in uh, all of California. They're from Northern Chumash, um, the land of San Luis Obispo, so Central Coast, California. And she has got all of her cultural accoutrement 
um, in her um, doll box or diorama. Um, the black and white um, triangle design is also found in modern street culture of California natives. Um, it's actually this pine cone design um, and you can kind of see the positive negative um, that shows up here in the pine cones that are placed on this um, classical pedestal, right? And this is this idea to raise, um, elevate the status of the pine cones as they're central to their um, cultural universe. Um, and she is um, dressed in the traditional regalia of um, the Northern Shumash. And this was a chance to really um, kind of counter uh, this idea of the Plains Indian um, being the only type of regalia that was often showing up in dolls and the attention um, to uh, the attention to and the celebration of our diversity. Um, each of our types and forms of regalia um, are really tied to our landscapes. Um, so the different bioregions that we're from, and I would say um, they're also tied to the health of those landscapes because we're using um, the healthy um, cultural precious items from those areas. Uh, and then my use of color really goes back um, to this idea, this psychological effect of um, just screaming that these uh, are modern indigenous women and so that people can um, very quickly understand um, that this is present day, that these are not um, historic pictures, uh, uh, historic photographs of women. Um, this is Wakia. She is um, Kiowa Comanche. She's dressed in traditional Southern buckskin um, and participates in powwow. I thought that this was an important one and this was actually where I started in the series um, because often uh, Plains Indians is the quick go-to um, but you'll see in those dolls um, that they don't even get those right and so they're often with um, you know faux buckskin made from felt and big pony beads when in reality um, it takes over um, a year, five, five family members over a year to make um, Wakia's traditional regalia. Um, she's beaded um, from head to toe and has even, you know, backup moccasins and shawls. A lot of people ask me about the suitcase. Um, this is kind of an inside nod and sense of humor um, because that's how most of us keep our regalia is actually in a suitcase to keep it safe. So that's actually Wakia's um, regalia suitcase. This one is Julia from Cochiti. Um, I am married into the Cochiti tribe. So this is my husband's niece and um, the items in this box are found um, from her grandmother's items as well as her great grandfather's drum. And each doll box is designed um, we actually build a life-size doll box, so this is not um, photoshopped. Uh, we actually hand paint a life-size doll box, um, this one with Coach T Pottery designs of, of wild spinach. And this one is from the same series of Julia and her daughter. This one is Amber Morningstar Byers. Um, and she is from Chata culture. So these are the items that she chose um, as her cultural accoutrement. Um, and we spent uh, many days and nights um, creating her doll box to look like the traditional Chata sash. And I wanted to show you a little um, short film of that behind the scenes. Oops, sorry. <laughs> and finally, um, my most recent collaboration was with Black Rock Editions on um, a photogravure, which is a technique that comes from the 
1950s. It's what um, Edward Curtis is known for. So um, steel faced um, copper etchings um, are actually inked and printed on paper. This one is of Arla Lucia. Um, and she is uh, a Native American, a Wonder Woman in this piece. And one more um, quick behind the scenes film before we go to uh, Q&A. Thank you so much, everyone, for um, allowing me to give that presentation. And I believe we're going to go uh, open it up to um, Q&A. Well, I'd like to uh, make a few comments. There are some important things that uh, Kara discussed uh, in her talk that are somewhat addressed in the exhibition. For instance, the series Water Memories, which I think probably addresses a lot of issues worldwide, both in terms of um, rising uh, water due to uh, global warming, to the um, use of dams, and then of course natural disasters that, that flood out areas where civilization or, or people or communities uh, once lived, and there are examples of that all around uh, the, the world. And although we don't get a chance to talk about that in the exhibition, there is, an, uh, for those of you who have seen the exhibition, there is uh, an image by William Garnett, who is a renowned uh, aerial photographer of Lake Powell. And the inclusion of that image was um, intentional in the sense that for those who would, for instance, hear this talk, uh, would make that connection between um, sort of the, the damming of the West um, and then the loss of, of uh, information about uh, civilizations that are important to, the, to that history. Um, another thing that I would um, just like to, to raise is that um, Kara talked about the, um, how, how bloody um, California was, what is now known as the state of California, in terms of the history of, of Native Americans and indigenous populations there. There is a, a very sobering book um, by Brendan Lindsay, and it's called Murder State, and it discusses in great detail with a great deal of uh, authoritative research um, the genocide that was levied upon um, virtually every native tribe um, that was present in California um, from the gold rush on and perhaps even before. Uh, so that's, uh, I think that's a really important and it's something that we'll address or I will address in several of the essays in the catalog uh, because I think it is uh, important to think about the landscape in terms of the people who were present. Um, and uh, I feel like the landscape has a, has a soul and that soul um, continues on despite um, all these tragedies that have occurred. And, and one of the things that is for perhaps most shocking about murder state um, is that in many instances, California law, uh, laws were passed and they use the word genocide. Um, intentionally, um, and it's 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 just it's horrific, and it's particularly horrific in terms of the times we're experiencing now. Um, and then Kara uh, uh, mentioned Standing Rock, and we have a couple of wonderful images by Ryan Visons uh, of the Standing Rock protests, which I think um, really speak to um, the many ways in which things haven't changed in the 1960s, since the 1960s and the rise of the civil rights and the American Indian movement. Um, but on the other hand, we have uh, wonderful people like Kara who, uh, and the other artists, for instance, those artists who were represented in uh, Last Indian Market, um, who uh, 
uh, who represent this new wave of um, ideas and creativity that I think is really important for us all to experience. So um, there are a number of comments in our in our chat. I know that um, Melissa is is looking at them, but one of there are actually two people, two photographers who have joined us um, for this event, and I'm very happy that they are both here. One is Zig Jackson, um, whose uh, image um, entering Zig's reservation, uh, <laughs> China Basin, San Francisco, California. Uh, is uh, the first image you see when you walk into the first gallery uh, on the museum's first floor. So we're really happy uh, to have Zig here. And the other is Johnny Chapman, who's a California native who's now uh, living and um, working in New York, another wonderful photographer whose work we're very happy to have in this exhibition alongside Kara's. So Kara, thank you very much for being with us tonight and for going through this and also for being willing to take questions. Um, I know that you have your chat pulled up as well. I was thinking that since Andrew had mentioned Zig Jackson, maybe we could go to one of, it wasn't so much a question, but one of his comments about how he wishes you could have named all the characters in the image that was the last Indian market. And I didn't know if you wanted to speak any more about that piece. We can also, if you want, I can um, offer to Zig to unmute his microphone in case the two of you would like to talk. Um, I think, uh, I just wanted to preface, I know I put it in the chat. I'm such a huge fan. Um, so it's really an honor to have Zig here. And, uh, you know, I think you were the first artist that I looked at as a young, um, person trying to do contemporary work and I was like that's it you know that's it um your series that you did in San Francisco was hugely influential on just all of us um that were at the institute um they were teaching with it in the late 90s and um anyways it's such an honor to have you here I'm gonna um share my screen and I have uh that um image pulled up and I will t say who they are from left to right So um, on the left here is Chris Ayer. He is the director of Smoke Signals. Um, this is Amber Dawn Barrow. Um, she is a Native American art historian and fashionista. Um, this is Kenneth Johnson. He is a seminal jeweler as Doubting Thomas. Um, this is my husband, Diego Romero, um, as a self-cast self as Judas. <laughs> This is Darren B. Hill Gray. Um, he is Hickory Apache painter. Um, Kathleen Wall is an amazing sculptor from Jemez Pueblo. Uh, Marcus Ammerman is um, an incredible Hopi Choctaw mixed media uh, master artist of um, just so many mediums, um, best known for uh, what we talk about um, as beadalism, um, his use of uh, realism in his beadwork. He was kind of um, the innovator and an inventor of that. Um, these two um, are husband and wife, um, Marion Denepa and Steve Lawrence. Um, they are from Okeowinge as well as uh, Lakota Hopi, um, husband and wife jeweler um, that live here in Santa Fe. This is Pilar Agoyo. Um, she works in um, as the head, uh, I guess, seamstress um, for all of the New Mexico film industry, um, particularly um, the lead on Native American um, uh, wardrobe was the word I was looking for. Um, this guy over here is Chinupa Hanska Luber, um, an incredible me mixed media um, sculpture artist um, enrolled at uh, um, Fort Berthold, Mandan, Hidatsa Arikara, also from Standing Rock. Um, this is Linda Loma Hoftawa. Uh, she is also Hopi Choctaw um, 2D printmaker and painter. And um, she's also a very beloved educator um, here at the Institute of American Indian Arts, where she was an instructor for over 35 years. And um, the incredible um, painter, America Meredith, um, she's Cherokee and also is the chief editor of First American Art Magazine. And if you don't subscribe to that, 
Um, it's an amazing um, by natives uh, for everyone, um, first American art magazine. Kara, thank you for that. Another question we had come in was about the Chemehuevi language and um, just how it's how it's being documented for the um, how it has been documented and for the future. Sure. So um, we actually uh, are one of the um, tribes that have suffered a great loss of language um, through colonization. However, we do have a few language speakers left. Um, we have had ethnographers and linguists do an incredible body of work through UC Berkeley, um, as well as a written documentation and dictionary by Carabeth Laird. Um, and then more recently, um, tribal member June Lavis has um, created uh, her own syllabary um, that uh, translates to um, uh, written um, and easy to read um, compared to the linguists um, type of writing for tribal members. So we have classes um, that we take there at the Chimwevi Cultural Center um, and we are doing our best to save language. Um, I, my, I myself speak like a toddler, but we do have a lot of language um, coming back. Um, there are also um, sister language speakers at Vegas Paiute um, as well as Moapa and all the way up to Kaibab. So there's a lot of um, cultural exchange um, and um, cultural sharing that's going on to preserve um, the Southern Paiute language as a whole. And then um, I hope that answers your specific question about Chimwevi language. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Kara. Another question that came in, um, you shared some of your more, more recent and current works. Is there anything that you're really excited to be working on that you haven't started yet? I am, um, I think, uh, just knee jerk. Um, I'm going to be working with an incredible organization called Illuminatives who have partnered with um, the Native Alliance organization, um, two nonprofits that work um, in contemporary representation for Native American peoples on a sort of rock the vote campaign. Um, so I'm going to step um, not out of the fine art world, but try and use some of my powerful imagery um, to encourage young people and all Native people to vote in the upcoming election, making sure that they get registered. Um, from there, um, I have a, a solo show that was postponed, um, that was coroned <laughs> from um, summer of 2020, um, that's been moved to the summer of 2021, um, which gives me ample time to work on a new body of work. Um, so I'll be starting to shoot that. Um, it'll probably um, turn out as a new 15 photograph series. I don't want to give too much away as far as the concept goes. Um, but it's going to be uh, a little bit like that um, Coyote Tales number one um, as that point in uh, narratives and have a lot of um, fun modern um, backgrounds and modern Native peoples tied to old stories. Um, and um, from there, I'm hopeful on a couple other projects. So uh, keep your fingers crossed that um, some grant and production money comes through. I'll find out in the next couple of months. Um, I would really like to do um, some more public art in 2021 um, in Southern California. Oh, this is all so exciting. Thank you. So we so, should, oh, go ahead. Oh, let me interject. For those of you who are unaware, Kara's work was included in Hearts of Our People. Um, and if you didn't see that exhibition, you should have, because it was probably one of the best exhibitions I've seen ever. Um, along with Wendy Redstar, but Kara, your work is also at the Heard Museum right now in um, Larger Than Memory, uh, which addresses some of those issues that I mentioned in the introduction, which is talking about um, the presence of uh, Native American people um, in a contemporary fashion, but also as a representative of, a, of this huge history um, un, in a, sort of an unbroken chain. So it's is been it, a really exciting time, um, you know, as museums are really taking an inward look at decolonization of a colonial institution. Um, they're having a lot of native advisory boards and um, from these native advisory boards um, and this emphasis on um, contemporary work, uh, it's 
we're seeing some really um, big dynamic contemporary shows coming out of those um, visions and missions and Hearts of Our People was the largest um, uh, show of all Native women artists. Um, it is going to be opening at the Philbrook in Oklahoma um, this month, I believe, towards the end of the month. So if you didn't get a chance to see it, um, it will open in Oklahoma. Uh, that's pretty exciting and Larger Than Memory is um, the largest contemporary show and there's 24 or 25 artists included in that one in Phoenix and it's open, uh, it sounds like through January. So I hope, um, I hope that if you get to travel, you can go see those and if not, go check them out online. Q&A. So Kara, um, just so we can make sure that we keep up with all the exciting projects that you're working on and that you hope to be working on, and we will keep our fingers crossed for you for those grants and so on, is your website the best place to go to, to keep an eye? Because I can put that website into our, into our chat. Yeah. If you want to go to my website and also sign up for um, like my mailing list, um, I'll do uh, email notifications and let people know like if there's, you know, a good body of news from my um, work, if that's the best way. And if you're on social media, um, I'm on Instagram and um, I have a Facebook professional uh, page as well as a personal page. So any of those are good places as well as my website. Perfect, and I did go ahead and put that website into the chat for anybody who's, who would like to click on that. Another question that came in, do you have any intentions in the future to talk about salt and sea and the indigenous and environmental history there? I think that that would be um, an, an amazing endeavor and uh, I could see that happening if that public art piece happens in Southern California. So um, thank you for um, planting the seed and we'll see. One of the things that's interesting about the Salton Sea area is that it is, like many places in the West, a sort of a, a magnet for photographers. And I know some of the photographers who are perhaps included in Magnetic West, but those images aren't shown, um, are images of Salton Sea. And it goes back to this, this idea about these areas um, that have been somehow affected by either rising water or, or um, the loss of water. So I think that's a, that would be a very interesting topic to see in the context of an exhibition and as a part of this larger tradition of, of dealing with these environmental issues. I think because of the time, we're actually going to wrap up the Q&A at this point, but I do wanna thank uh, you, Kara, for entertaining our audience's questions. For those participants who didn't get a chance to ask a question or haven't had, um, if it hasn't come to you yet, but you wake up in the middle of the night and you just need to know an answer, I'm sure that if you send that to me or to Andrew, we can get that to Kara and hopefully get that answered for you. You will have my email address from um, when I sent the link out to you this afternoon. And Kara Thank has you. a special, um, you have a special offer, uh, if I may interject. I, thank you, I didn't wanna forget. Um, I'm so appreciative of everybody um, attending this evening. Uh, I um, created a discount code for everybody that did log in and um, watch the show. It's Figgy2020, um, so Melissa will put that in the chat. And if you decide to buy um, something from that website um, and enter that code at checkout, it's good for 25% off everything until midnight for the attendees um, this evening. So um, if you don't own something and you want to own something, um, now's a great time to purchase. And that's so generous of you, thank you. Also so generous of you to spend this evening with us. We're incredibly grateful, Kara. Thank, thank you, you. Kara. So to be here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Yeah, thank you so much um, to everyone, to Kara, to Andrew. It's a beautiful exhibition. If you haven't had a chance to come down and see the exhibition yet, it is open through October 4th. And for those of you who plan to visit the museum in person to see that, please remember to check out the Figgies website for updated information on museum hours, those visitor sessions that I mentioned earlier, and also, we do recommend that you register in advance for a session. 
And in that way, you'll also get those policies and procedures that we have to keep you safe when you're visiting the museum. So again, thank you, Kara. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you to all of our guests tonight. We look forward to seeing you at future programs. Remember next week, it's not on Thursday. It's on Tuesday, September 15th. And that's Wendy Red Star. Um, we hope to see you there. And we hope that you have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much for coming, you guys. Thank you.